Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, which seems like an appropriate name, uh, considering our speakers tonight, uh, for tonight's forum. Uh, we're really excited about this forum. Um, we're pleased to have, uh, um, to welcome back to our stage the former governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis, uh, who also was a, uh, has taught off and on here at the Kennedy School, has been a long time in front of the IOP. He's going to introduce um, our IOP fellow, George Papandreou, formally. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Governor Dukakis. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thank you all very much. Well, it's good to be back where I spent uh, a part of my involuntary sabbatical from the governor's office, but had a great experience here and really learned how to teach here at the Kennedy School uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s. And I've been back many times, needless to say, but a special privilege to be able to be on this stage with somebody who I've known for a long time and admired and uh, has a lot to tell us about not only Greece, but Europe and what's happening, what may be happening, what he thinks should be happening. It's also a real pleasure for both of us to be joined by our respective spouses. And uh, good to have you both here. But the star of this audience is our barber. George Papalimbaris, who um, I've been going to since I came over to the Kennedy School to teach, George. 1978, and who has cut my hair, George's hair. Whatever exists. Uh, <laughs> Dimitri Avramopoulos' hair, who is now the foreign minister. I mean, it's a steady stream of Greeks and Greek Americans over the La Flamme. So if you're getting a hair cut someplace else, stop. Go right over to La Flamme. And uh, this man not only gives you a great haircut, he's got one of the smartest political heads I've ever known. And in fact, my last haircut was the Saturday before the election. And George told me exactly what was going to happen. I was getting kind of nervous, not so much about Elizabeth Warren, but about the president. He assured me everything was going to be fine, and it was. So great to have you with us. Thanks for coming. I know you've got George's biography, so we don't have to go through all of that, but as some of you may know, he's a graduate of Amherst College. Um, mother was American, and uh, comes from a long and distinguished Greek family that has been deeply and actively involved in modern Greek history a long, long time. And we're lucky enough to have him as a fellow. Um, I think you all know that he was prime minister at a particularly difficult stage of this whole Greek thing. And uh, although I'm not sure anybody's giving him credit for it, uh, some of the most fundamental reforms that have taken place in Greece were the result of his leadership. Not easy, folks. Not easy. So great to have you with us. Nice to be here. As always. And, I want you all to know that Kitty and I will be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary this coming year. Ah, yeah. um, as, as she often says, it has never been dull. And uh, we're taking our three kids, their spouses, and our eight grandkids to the island of Crete to celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. So we look forward to seeing you guys Great when we're there. there. Um, George, let me kick this off with a question, because I must say, I'm as puzzled by some of the things that are going on in an economic and political sense as Europe as I have been from time to time by what's happened in the United States. Um, I thought, at least here in the U.S., that uh, after Herbert Hoover, and I'm a child of the Depression, we would never again try to get out of a serious recession or depression with austerity because it doesn't work. We Greeks have a saying, right? Pathima, mathima. Pathima, for you non-Greek speakers, pathima means things happen. Mathima, you're supposed to learn from them. It even rhymes. Remember that, pathima, mathima. And yet, there are folks here in the United States, and certainly people now in the European community, who seem to think that what I would refer to as Herbert Hoover economics can get us out of a recession. Why is that happening? I mean, we kind of look at Europe and we think, well, 
you know, they've been through so much of this. They know how to deal with this, these economic... They, they'd never impose an austerity regime on, on countries as a means for getting them out. Explain this to, to us. Well, Mike, first of all, let me also say it's an honor to be with you. And I uh, first met you when you were governor many years ago, and uh, we had come here as a undersecretary for Greeks of the diaspora. Right. And I'm um, very proud to, to be with you. Uh, and, of course, uh, this is, for me, also a respite, a sort of a, a great honor to be here at, at, at Harvard. And uh, if it's any consolation, uh, I, I came back from Japan where I had given a speech, and I went to the counter to check my ticket, um, and uh, there was a young Japanese woman and a young Japanese man, and uh, they looked at my passport. It said, uh, diplomatic passport, former Greek prime minister, there was a little consternation there. They said, do you have an address in the US? Because I was going coming to Boston. So I pulled out my Harvard ID. And all of a sudden, their faces lit up, red carpet, <laughs> everything changed. So um, maybe it's better here. Who knows? <laughs> Hang on to it. Yeah. But um, that's a good question. You see, I, I think what one of the issues was that we had a major international crisis, of course, began in Wall Street, but it was international, uh, linked around the world. And, of course, we were responsible in Greece for bad governance, uh, clientelism, I would say crony capitalism in some areas too, and that sort of was a weak link in the European construction. But at the same time, I began, from the very beginning, I realized, first of all, and I said this, whatever measures we took, we could do somersaults, that's a Greek, another expression, we could, economic ytubis. We, mm. could do, we could do whatever we could in, in cutting our, 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 our deficit, but this was also a European problem. Uh, it was a problem of the construction of the euro, it was a problem of the competitiveness of, of Europe, vis-a-vis -vis the emerging markets, it was a problem of uh, certain governance structures, and the need for some growth, growth stimulus in, in Europe. Uh, but it was a, a very inconvenient truth, if you like, that uh, I, was, I was then talking about. It was much easier for people to say, this is a Greek problem. These, are, you know, these Greeks are profligate, they, you know, they, they're not working hard, they're lazy. Well, you and I know, uh, as Greeks in the diaspora, how Greeks can work and how um, innovative they can be. As a matter of fact, if you look at the OECD statistics, Greeks work more working hours than any other European. Uh, and uh, so this was, this, was, this was an easy sort of narrative. Uh, but it, what it meant, of course, is that we didn't deal with the essential problems uh, in, in Europe. I think now people are understanding that we have to make more changes. And as a matter of fact, we have moved ahead in Europe in, in constructing uh, the types of institutions, or at least beginning to construct the types of institutions to deal with the fact that we are uh, a common currency, but still we don't have common economic policy, we don't have common monitoring, we don't have uh, a common tax system, uh, which, which makes it very difficult. And also the even governance of, of Europe is very difficult. It's sort of like having 50 governors deciding with a very weak federal government, uh, and that is, of course, problem. Kind of like the Articles of the Confederation, right? Here That's in the right. United States before. Uh, Absolutely, and I think some of the analogies there of how the U.S. Uh, became more of a federa federated state uh, uh, are very interesting lessons to be learned for Europe. But um, uh, at the same time, the the uh, the growth uh, issue is still a big, a major issue for Europe, and I think that. Uh, Why is that, though, George? I don't understand it. I mean, we've now had, what, three, four, five years of this, and um, even a Portugal, which has done everything the EU has asked it to do, is struggling badly. Um, now we're starting to get demonstrations and anger and all that kind of thing in the streets of Portugal. I mean, at some point, doesn't the European community begin to realize that it isn't working and that some kind of growth strategy is, is in order here? Well, I think there's a combination of, of a number of things. First of all, a conservative dominance in Europe. I'm, I'm happy as you are uh, by the fact that in the United States we have the Democratic president re-elected, Barack Obama, because I believe this is important for a number of issues, but certainly also for economic policy around the world. 
and the fact that uh, austerity is not the solution. Uh, so I think there's one, one is that sort of dogmatic view that uh, if you simply cut, uh, everything will be solved and you will, you will create confidence in the markets. So as a matter of fact, the markets aren't confident about, about that strategy and they have constantly been, uh, been um, uh, mistrustful of the decisions we've been making in Europe. Now we've made some very important decisions, but they've been mistrustful. And we've been muddling through, of course, and, and, and I do hope, I'm, I'm optimistic in the long term, but it's been very, very painful. I think the second, uh, the second is what I said earlier, is that there's this narrative of um, almost a cultural stereotyping, which unluckily has taken hold, and I think that's undermined the actual concept of Europe. Europe was built up after the Second World War as a concept to get beyond nationalisms, get to beyond the stereotyping, get beyond racism, anti-Semitism, or whatever forms of, of, of prejudice. Uh, I think we have seen w Europe coming through a, going through a, a financial crisis, but also a crisis of, at, at the global level, of its power being somewhat dissipated, the emerging markets, the changes around the world. Uh, many of the reactions are, let's sort of become more tribal. Let's move into our little cocoons. And you see the growth of nationalism. Uh, in Europe. In Europe, in, yeah. in, in countries, uh, in, in certain, you even have neo-Nazis. We unluckily have uh, this in Greece also, which is a very, it's, 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 it's a sense of, uh, it's a false sense of empowering uh, of the people that feel disempowered. So I think that that also has been a part of the narrative, okay, that this is a problem which the South has and, and it's not a question of growth and so on. I think that we need, of course, we need to revamp our economies. We need to become more, more, more competitive. But, for example, as you said, even Spain. Spain was running a surplus. Spain had followed the so-called Maastricht criteria, which were the basic criteria for not needing a bailout and, not, and also following the rules. They were, they were doing you know, very well, but they were hit by the crisis. They were hit by the construction bubble, they were hit by the world crisis, and they were hurt. So it's not the Spaniards they were to blame. It is a systemic problem. And I think this is what we have to drive, continue to drive in, in Europe as, 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 a, as an so answer. So what evidence is there that European opinion, if I can use that term, is changing? Well, I or think, I th I think this, this is going to be a debate which is, is going to be ongoing over the next years. Uh, we, uh, for example, there was, uh, if you see even in Germany, the, some months ago there was an 80% uh, of the Germans were saying that Greece would exit the euro and they would think it's the best thing to do. Now it's 50%, so it's, uh, so it's in the middle. Uh, I think what we need to do is we need to bring a new narrative again, which is maybe not a new one, but say, and this is not just a European question, this is a, I think a worldwide question, the planet the issues we deal with, whether it's the financial crisis, whether it's a global climate change, whether it's, uh, whether it's migration, we need to get beyond these uh, national, uh, the nationalistic, if you like, uh, um, narratives. Yes, we can be proud of our nation. Yes, we can be proud of what we do, but we're not going to find enemies out there. We have to find allies out there. We have to find partners out there. We have to find ways to work together to deal with these problems. That is the narrative that has to come back to Europe. And I think there are strong forces in Europe and basically the progressive forces in Europe that are using this, that are building up this narrative. I believe in the elections in Germany, there will be, whatever the result, a more pro-European and a less sort of uh, narrow-minded government being formed. Who are some of the European leaders, George, today that you think will carry this forward, who agree with you and I think it's time for policies that emphasize growth and... Well, I think that, that you, you have uh, actually even sort of across some of the parties, there, you have the conservatives, uh, you have the socialists, you have the greens, uh, you have the liberals. Liberals in, in Europe are uh, not exactly the liberal in the US. Yeah. I mean, the right. socialists would be the liberals in, right. in the US. Right. The, the right. liberals in, the, in, in Europe would be more the um, sort of free marketeers in a right. sense, right. Um, uh, but also liberal in, in, in as far as uh, human rights are concerned and so on. And of course, the Greens concerning the green growth and the environment. I would say that you have uh, a cross-cutting uh, 
a group in there of, of, of politicians that uh, some of them are former leaders, some of them are, are active leaders today, that are really look forward towards more integrated Europe. Uh, recently, um, to, uh, to uh, the leaders for Hofstadt, who used to be the Prime Minister of Belgium, he's in the Liberal Party, and Cohn Bendit, who was in the 1968 uh, May uh, revolts of, in Paris, uh, who is now head of the Green Party in the, Parli the European Parliament, came out with a common book talking about a, a federal Europe. Uh, so there are people there that are, are pushing this. I would say also the Socialist Party, very much so, and much more in solidarity. Uh, and I think what we are slowly seeing is more of a European politics building up because, of course, we had lots of our national politics, even as parties, uh, building up around the whole European theme. Uh, so I think we'll see, we will see the, uh, a, an ongoing, uh, it may be a drama, it may be, it may be a difficult uh, uh, situation, but I think there are, there are forces out there that are, want a real progressive change in Europe. And I think it's important for the world. It's important for the world, Mike, because Europe is really an experiment of how we might deal with globalization around the world. Regions working together more closely, whether it's ASEAN or whether it's uh, the African Union, whether it's the different Latin American organizations, um, uh, in order to be able to deal with some of the global issues beyond the national borders, and also looking at see how we can uh, we can we can uh, look for more representative and democratic institutions at the governance level beyond our nations. Uh, for example, in, in Europe now, we're starting to discuss, and this is something I've been a proponent of, electing a president. Electing a of European, Europe. Of Europe. Electing a European president by the people of Europe. Now, it might be through electoral colleges, or it might be through some don't, other means. Don't try the electoral college. Don't try that. OK. Well, thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> we're trying to get rid of that here. We don't need that. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see your any advice for sure. But it's a, a, an elected chief executive. That's right. Because you can see, I'll give you from my experience, when we have 27 countries here, it's pretty much like having 27 governors. Right, right. We, we get down together, we have to make decisions very quickly. Sometimes, and this is another, another problem you have with in these in international crises. I remember um, we're in Brussels, it's a Sunday night, uh, it's about 10 to 2 in the morning, and we are just discussing the package for Greece and for the whole mechanism, for the bailout mechanism. Very, very important discussions for for the European institutions. And somebody says, we've got 10 minutes. I say, 10 minutes, why? He says, in 10 minutes, the Japanese market, stock markets are open. So this is what politics is today. We are under this very, very strong pressure with crises, and I think more and more so. But that is undermining our, our democratic institutions and our democratic cap capability and the sense of empowerment our people need. So we need, I think, to empower at the local level but also empower institutions democratically at the regional level. So this is what I would see a, 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 a president of the European Union. Rather than having the, uh, if, if you have 27 governors, it will gravitate towards the stronger states. And that's, of course, why Germany now is playing such an important role. No, and it's really, you know, I mentioned uh, the Articles of the Confederation. Those of you who are students of American history, it's, it's remarkably similar to that, what we had. I mean, there was a president, but the president simply was the chairman of the, chairman of the board could serve for only one term as the chairman of this board of representatives, each of which had one single representative, the 13 states, and of course it didn't work and evolved. Talk to us a little bit about Greece, please. Well, Greece is going through a very difficult period. Uh, we obviously are, are paying for, for past, past problems, but uh, I would have wanted to, uh, to go for more uh, reform and less austerity giving us more time for the changes. As a matter of fact, I've always said the debt and the deficit are sort of the tip of the iceberg of the problems, uh, the root problems of, of the governance structures. And, and the governance structures were the fact that uh, we have, uh, we had a system and, which was, was non-transparent, uh, quite clientelistic, and I would say even politics captured by some of the big interests. Now, I don't think that Greece is so different from what's happening in other parts of the world. You see politics being captured by big interests. You yeah. see government being captured by big interests. I think that this dichotomy very often between markets and government uh, is a false dichotomy. It's, you can have good markets, or well-regulated, or badly regulated, and they're always regulated. So there's a myth about regulation and non-regulation. And government can be good and bad. I grew up 
and I saw a dictatorship. So I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, so pro-government just in general. I want to see good governance and democratic governance. Do governments and do markets work for the public, public good? Well, in Greece, I feel that power was concentrated uh, in the hands of the few, and, and money was, was, was spent in, in, in the wrong way. The resources were lost. Uh, and we were, of course, able to borrow quite, quite, uh, quite cheaply for quite a long period of time. And particularly after the crisis uh, the, 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 in 2008, this then blew up. I had to deal with that. Um, and luckily, I had to take very painful decisions. And talk a little bit about that, because I'm not sure that uh, many people understand that some very fundamental reforms took place when you were prime minister. Painful, politically very unpopular, but I think they're there to stay. Talk a little bit about what those were. Well, first of all, transparency. I think that you know, it, we need transparency. It's part of our, our, our democratic legacy. It's part of empowering our citizens. Uh, so one thing I did is I put every, uh, every um, budget uh, item, uh, uh, resource, uh, revenues, expenditures on the, on the, uh, on the uh, internet. So now everybody knows exactly what that we're That had never been done before. Never been done before. We, uh, we created an open government uh, system where we actually uh, announced to high political positions were, were, were uh, decided upon after a public uh, announcement where we actually went through in a more merit meritocratic way of choosing them. We brought in full meritocracy for any government employee, any civil servant, uh, so to fight and break clientelism. Um, we uh, consolidated local government uh, from, from uh, some 57 regions to 13 regions. We revamped the pension system so that it's viable for the next generation, of course, with Substantially increase the retirement age as well. Right? We, had to, we had to raise the ent entire retirement age for a number of groups, uh, and, and, and luckily very, very quickly, so that women, uh, some, of the, some women in the civil service who could retire at 45 and have to retire at 60 or 5, and that they, they, they didn't, weren't able to really plan very much. So these were very painful reforms. Some of these austerity measures, of course, were cutting wages and cutting, and cutting uh, pensions. Uh, so, so we revamped the educational system, which had uh, many difficulties at, at a tertiary level. Uh, the the um, health system and the procurement system uh, of, of to sort of make sure that there's more, more, more um, transparency again. And, of course, we opened up something like 150 professions which were closed professions, taxis, truck drivers. We had quite a, quite a bit of difficulties, as you might remember, a year ago and during the tourist season. But uh, we needed to do this. So these were tough reforms we had to make. And of course, revamping the state, we have now cut down in, in public, public employees. Um, but of course, reorganizing will take some time. One of the major areas of reorganizing is tax evasion. Uh, now, taking tax evasion of course, there has been a culture of tax evasion in Greece, and I think one of it is that people didn't feel that the, their money was actually uh, going where they felt it should go. Uh, you know, the state was not working that well. Mm -hmm. But there's another issue which I think just shows how the Greek problem is a wider problem. Uh, tax havens. Now, uh, this is a world problem. So when I went to the, our, my counterparts in We Europe, heard about it during our own campaign a little bit, didn't we? Tax havens. It's an issue here too. So, so, so sometimes you look at Greece as a, as you know, uh, fire in the kitchen, but then you have the fire in the in the house, which is Europe, and then you have fire in the neighborhood, which is the whole financial system. Now, if people can take out their money, move money capital from one place to another without being taxed, that is really robbing revenues from from your people. So, when we are asked to take austerity measures for the average Greek, uh, I mean, you can feel people get pretty pretty riled up when they feel that they have, uh, uh, others are being able to, to move out and, and, and hide their money somewhere else, somewhere around the world. Uh, I started negotiations with the Swiss government, but that's only one government, it takes a long time. This is a world problem. But I would say that, that we have made major reforms, just to, just to come back to your question, uh, sometimes we have been criticized, well, Greece hasn't made, hasn't changed. Well, first of all, this is two and a half years, so we're talking about decades of problems where we now have to solve. Uh, and don't forget, Greece went through civil wars, world wars, Balkan wars, dictatorships, 
an authoritarian, authoritarian state which really didn't change after the dictatorship fell and we got into the European Union. So some of these problems were papered over. But the OECD came out a few months ago and ranked all the industrialized countries of the world as to how they fared after 2008 crisis. Which ones made more reforms than others? And Greece was number one. So we're number one in the world as far as reforms are concerned. I think that's a legacy. That will remain. We will have a stronger Greece. Greece are a proud people. They're, we're going through a difficult time, but there's great potential for Greece. And you're quite optimistic, aren't you, looking forward, assuming you can get the kind of European policies that will stimulate growth. If you live in Greece today, you feel the pain. So uh, it's difficult to say that one's optimistic. But yes, I am optimistic. I am optimistic because I know we'll go through it. And Greece has potential, as I mentioned. We have uh, not only the tourism, and you're all welcome. And We're going to try to do the best we can to add a little <laughs> bit to that next year. You're all welcome. Um, and, and the tourism is thriving even through this crisis, despite all the, you know, the media hype around uh, demonstrations and so on. You know, this is you know, one part of Athens, and not, not every day. But um, that's part of democracy also. But, the, the, then we have uh, the, the, our agricultural sector is, is, is re, revamping into more ecological and biological foods. Uh, we are m moving into uh, aquaculture. We're number one actually in, in fish farming uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, shipping, of course, is, 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 is major, and, and we're trying to see how we can get our ship owners to invest in Greece. Um, because of the, what's happening in Asia, we're getting investments from, uh, from China, getting investments from some of the Arab countries, because they see that they want to make investments Greece a hub. In what, George, what kind For of example, things? China has just invested in a major port just by Piraeus, because it wants to make Greece a hub for all its trade to the European market. Uh, and they have also invested in Greek shipping, something to the tune of I don't know how many tens of billions, to help build uh, Greek ships that will be helping transport Chinese products to Europe. So there is a great potential for investment in Greece, as long as there is a sense of, of stability. Now, as you said, it also depends on whether Europe gets its act together. Now, it seems that it, we have made some moves. Uh, the bank, the central bank, has you know, come out more, more aggressively. Uh, we have uh, a so-called European st stability mechanism. Uh, but we need to move further. Banking Union, for example. Uh, I'll just give you an example that in, when the, during the time when, when people were saying Greece might leave the euro, well, you know what the Greeks did. And, and any logical person would do this. They would say, I'm going to take my euros out of the bank, and I'm going to put it under my pillow, maybe to some other, some other place outside the country. It's sort of like saying Massachusetts or, or some other right. state you know, might go to the peso. Well, what would you do with your dollars? And what would you, would you invest? You wouldn't invest. You wouldn't consume. You would wait. Now, we've had that paucity of economic activity for the last two, two and a half years. We need the stability. We need the security. We need a more humane I mean, that's going to approach. continue unless and until you get some degree of stability. Yeah, it? and a wider stability inside the euro. And I think now the recent decision just 10 days ago in the Eurogroup gives uh, a, a strong message that Greece will remain inside the euro. And if we can deal with the difficult issues also, Spain and Italy, which I do hope we will deal, deal with. Uh, and then the, not only the markets, but investors in general uh, will sort of feel that Europe is a safe place to invest. I think we will then start seeing things turning around and, and growth coming. Now, I again would also see a stimulus in, in, in Europe necessary. And I would add to that that the stimulus should be uh, in an area which is not just a stimulus. It's not just stimulating consumption, uh, because consumption could be just buying some products from some other country. It would be to, in, to, to, to invest in the necessary infrastructure for a more federated and, 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 and united Europe, but also more competitive Europe, such as green energy grids, green growth, uh, in, in by developing green energy also, uh, transportation, and I would say green transportation again, research and education in these areas, which would make uh, our produce and our, and our products uh, much more competitive around the world. You mentioned one other thing before we go out to the audience and have our discussion with all of you. Um, you and I are old enough to remember 
at least to know about a history, not only in Greece, but in other European countries, in which uh, economic instability produced extreme political movements. Um, Greece had a fascist dictatorship, uh, which didn't really know what side it was going to join for a while, That's right? Right, right in right. World War II. A lot of folks don't realize that. Maybe they remember the colonels, but they don't remember Metaxas and, and that whole period as well. And now you're getting this new version of uh, a kind of fascist movement, which is being fueled, it seems to me, by this instability. Don't, doesn't the European leadership understand this? I mean, don't they understand that there are very serious political dangers to put it coming down with a hammer on Greece? in a way that uh, encourages I think, I, I right-wing think, extremism. I think they should, and, I, I think, and I'd be very critical well, of You've talked to them, haven't you? I've, about I've talked to them, and I've been, and I've been very critical. Are they of, concerned? Of, uh, they're concerned, uh, and, but unluckily, some of the conservative leaders in the European Union have used this narrative of, of um, sort of um, whether it's a, a phobia against migration, whether it's the Islamophobia, or whether it's the phobia now against the Southerners, uh, or the northerners, it doesn't matter, it's, 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 yeah. uh, it can be mutual, uh, to use this, use this as a, a false, I would use it a false sense of empowering our citizens. If people, you, you're telling your people that, you know, here I am a savior and I will, I will lead you to, to, you know, to fight against these bad guys that are in, um, in, in other guys in, in Europe. While I think we need real empowerment of, of our citizens, and that you won't get from a conservative policy. Uh, real empowerment. And these folks aren't conservatives. I mean, they're, they're, it's, 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 it, it looks like kind of homegrown fascism to me. Yeah, it? well, you get extremes. And I would say that some, but even some of the more so called moderate conservatives have played a bit on this, on this, on this sort of nationalistic and prejudicial uh, uh, narrative. And, uh, and I think we're, we're, we're paying for it now in, in, in Europe. And uh, I think it's. it's um, but I think it's, this is something which, which you see in many countries because the types of problems we are facing around the world are very complex. And, and I would add to, add to this that, that you know, we are, the, the younger generation, I mean, this generation is, is going to deal with the most uh, unique and difficult challenges that humankind has ever dealt with. Global warming, uh, a planet of, 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 of a globalized economy, uh, the great interdependence, we haven't seen this before. Uh, and, and, and I think what, what our generation needs to do in, in politics is to be able to empower this younger generation to, uh, who, who knows? I mean, they know that we have resources. We can make poverty history, for example. We can uh, deal with the climate change problem. We have the resources, we have the technology, we have the knowledge. But you see it concentrated in the hands of a few, you see great inequality, and you see that you know, our national institutions uh, sometimes captured, sometimes not enough for even our democratic societies. And I think this is where we need to start changing, empowering our citizens, in, whether it's through education, whether it's through uh, using new technologies like crowdsourcing for solutions, but also looking at the global situation where you know, the G2s or the G7s or 8s or the G20s are not enough. And very often they're just a talking shop and no real action, and I think this is also what we need to look at. Advice to the President and the Congress about what, in addition to getting our own act together here, are there any things we should be doing to help the European situation? Well, I think the, the European situation is Israel, Mike, and, 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 and you know Greece uh, well, uh, and sometimes we, we forget where Greece is, and not only Greece, where Southern Europe, Europe is geographically, what, looking on the map. If you look at Southern Europe, I mean, when just a few months ago, we evacuated 20,000 Chinese from Libya to Crete to then go to Beijing, because we are the closest to Benghazi. Um, look at Southern Europe, the crisis, and look at, uh, at the Arab Spring. Now, I've heard some of the younger Arabs in Tunisia and in Egypt saying, we don't want to be like Europe, because look at the crisis they have there. Look at what's happening in Southern Europe. So, I think the solution of, of, if we deal with this crisis in Europe, we will be a model for this younger generation in the Arab world. If we take the Mediterranean, what I would think, what I would suggest is that the, the U.S., there are so many common interests there. We're talking about the Middle East peace problem. We're talking about the Arab Spring. We're talking about Greek-Turkish relations. 
uh, the wider Middle East, if you go to Syria, Iraq, uh, the, the uh, northern Africa, why not uh, develop a green Marshall Plan for that region with the Europeans to stimulate growth, to deal with the huge... U.S. Amount, and Europe. U.S. and yeah. Europe. Uh, look at the, the energy issue, not just the conventional energy, but also the alternative and renewable energies, because Mediterranean has the capability to build this up, linking this region as a peace project, linking it also as a problem, as a, as a question of dealing with the unemployment, which is not only in southern Europe, but you have a huge uh, population of younger generation Arabs uh, in northern Africa that are well-educated, but it's very explosive because they are going through transition and the economy is not, is not developing, but also linking them together and seeing if we can deal with the, you know, seeing this as part of a process to even deal with more difficult issues such as the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, we need to work together. Again, this is what the European project has been. So let's use that European spirit for this area, which is so crucial for the world. Okay, I think we're ready to start entertaining your questions and reactions, response, and so forth. So. I guess you go to the mic and we take you as best we can. Sure, tell us who you are and what um, you do. Hi, my name is John Soylu. I am from Turkey. I'm a uh, sophomore at the college. Yasu Baristopoli for coming and speaking to <laughs> us. Um, I have a question um, about your political career. Many might say um, that you had to take many difficult decisions that were very unpopular in the short run. And you know, a lot of times politicians say, I'm the right guy, I have to stay in power so that I can do the right thing eventually. But you were not afraid to you know, um, help your people um, take the, the bitter pill. And, and you know, some might say you fell on your sword because of that. And um, how did you deal with those de decisions? How did you sort of communicate those decisions with your party knowing how unpopular it might be? And uh, do you ever regret um, you know, the, 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 some of the, deci the decisions that you took? Uh, uh, one of those difficult questions. Uh, the, as, as you know, um, being a Turk, uh, I was foreign minister in, in, in Greece and uh, I, I basically changed Greek-Turkish policies, our policies, and, and when I got into the foreign ministry, I said, you know, I can, I can go through as any, of, any other foreign minister and just, you know, you know, be very critical about Turkey and say how bad things are bad, and we can continue the sort of uh, arguing about all, all kinds of issues. But I said, you know, this is, a, this is, when you're in politics, when you get into the position of responsibility, you're there to do something. You're there to change something, and you should try, and I did. I tried, and initially, initially, um, people even called me a traitor uh, in Greece. After a number of years, 70% of the Greek population was in favor of the policies we were pursuing, and of course, the relations between Greece and Turkey have changed. We haven't solved all our issues. I mean, there's the Cyprus issue, you know, there's the issue of the overflights and things like that, but we have a much different qualitative relationship amongst ourselves, certainly amongst our peoples, uh, as you know, and I think that's that's that's... That, that thing. Now, in, 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 in deciding uh, that I had to, um, you know, I, I, had, I had believed that if Europe had made uh, altogether the types of decisions early on to calm the markets, we wouldn't have had to make so difficult and drastic uh, decisions in Greece, you know, cutting, we cut uh, five and a half, five, five percent, it's up to six percent now in two years of GDP deficit. Now, this is a huge, um, uh, huge, amazing sacrifices by the Greek people, uh, and we did it. Uh, but of course, it it, uh, it 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 was costly, costly not only for the Greek people but also for uh, my political capital. But I said I had to do it to 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 save Greece, and also I had to do I had to 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 accept the fact that we had to have get into the so-called mechanism, the troika mechanism, in order to make sure that Greece was able to be uh, wouldn't go for bank to bankruptcy. Now, that made, made it, we had to follow a very difficult and austere program, as, as Mike was saying. But at the same time, I was saying, whether it costs me or not, my conscience is not holding onto the chair. I mean, that's not, that's not going to be my legacy, you know, how long I'll be a prime minister. It's whether I'll do right for my country. And I feel I did right for my country. Now, there'll be people that'll be critical of that, of course. 
but I feel that according to my conscience, I did right because that was necessary to be done. And I even proposed a coalition government where I said, I will step down to make sure that we have a wider coalition, which we actually did create at some point after I had proposed the referendum. Uh, then many people said, well, let's have a coalition government. But we, we did it. There still is a coalition government even after two elections. And I do hope that this will, will, program will now succeed. Thank you. Let me also say, as the son of somebody who was born in Edremit, in Turkey, came here when he was 15, that I think Georgia's leadership on Greek-Turkish relations was extraordinary. Um, I mean, he was out there doing something that I don't remember any Greek political figure having done in my lifetime. And I think it's made a fundamental difference in the relationship between the two com countries, which I thought was long over. And uh, for those of you, and I hope there are lots of you here, young people who are thinking about public service, don't anybody tell you that you can't make a difference. This guy made a difference. I'd like to think I made a difference. Um, sometimes you get knocked and you're, you know, I owe you all an apology. If I'd beaten Bush one, you'd never heard of Bush two. We wouldn't be in this mess, so <laughs> you can blame me for that. But um, I hope lots of you are thinking about getting deeply and actively involved in politics and public service. There's nothing like it. And sure, occasionally you're going to have defeats and maybe sometimes tough ones. But uh, you really can make a difference, and this guy made a difference. Thank you. Radically so, I thought. Okay, who's next? Good evening, my name is Sarah Fale. I'm a freshman at the college. Thank you for speaking to us today. During the financial crisis, central banks kind of went from being more of a background actor to taking center stage politically. How do you think central... Several, hmm? Several who? Central banks. Oh, central banks, yes. Mm -hmm. How do you think the relationship between government and central banks has changed over the last few years? And in particular, how do you think that affects government transparency, considering many of these bank officials aren't directly elected? Good question. I think that's, it's not, not only the central banks. Central banks did play a role and have, and, and I would say in many ways have played a constructive role, actually. And if you look at what the Fed has done here, if you look at what the central bank in... Though of a considerable opposition from American <laughs> conservatives. You're right. Needless to say. Absolutely. You don't want the guy reappointed. Romney, I think, during the campaign said that he would not reappoint him. No. In fact, he tried to get rid of him. Didn't well, he? Did, but this, but, but had that not been done, I think we would have been, as you were saying, you were implying earlier, Mike, that uh, uh, the recession would have been much deeper and we may have gotten into a vicious circle of, of a recession which then moved into a depression. So uh, now federal banks can do only so much because uh, if, if the, what you have is people don't want to borrow sometimes in crises and, uh, and, and banks aren't necessarily wanting to lend because they're looking at their accounts. And I think this is the wider financial problem you we have. And, 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 and you, we have seen a move from the real economy to a strong... Uh, an overly powerful financial uh, sector, which uh, is not investing in, in, in where I think we should be investing. Where we, this is where I think governance needs to redirect, whether it's industrial policy, whether it's the green growth policy, whether it's you know investing in the in, in research and education. This is where I think we do need to have do need, we do need to have governance, governments looking to see where we will invest. Markets alone will not create the necessary changes or investments in our societies that are necessary for the types of challenges we have ahead of us. I mean, we have huge, you have even, even bigger challenges and when we're talking about climate change and so on, the types of changes we'll need in societies from education to, to our infrastructure. But the central banks, yes, have played a role. Um, and this has been, when we and set up- And you're arguing for much stronger role for European central bank. I, right? I'm arguing for a much stronger role as far as, as, far as the, the control of the financial sector. For example, um, a banking union. You can't have a, a, a Spaniard with euros and a Greek with euros and a German with euros feeling that uh, on the one hand the Spaniard may lose, may not, that euro, that same euro may not have the same worth because you're in Spain as if you're in Germany. So a banking union would mean, uh, a, 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 uh, would mean that you would have a, an authority would be a bank resolution if a bank fails. Uh, a, a credit union also, so that people are guaranteed that if they have a euro, it's a euro, and they, you know, and they, then you don't go, they don't run on banks, and uh, and a monitoring system by the central bank to make sure that the financial system is working well. So we would want a stronger, a stronger central bank, and of course I would say, from my point of view, that the mandate that the Fed has in the U.S. 
It's different from the mandate in 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 in, uh, uh, in Europe. The German concern of the um, uh, of the the Hitler situation, where inflation uh, created then a huge political problem. Uh, Made, uh, when we had negotiations to set up the central bank, the only mandate was inflation. Now, of course, one has to forget, we shouldn't forget that actually it was high unemployment also that created the crisis uh, during the Weimar regimes and, and the interim, mm -hmm. the war, uh, inter, interwar period. So I would like to see as the Fed that the, the central bank also has as a mandate the question of employment. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where I think politics has to be, uh, the governance has to be uh, somewhat more, more robust. Somebody way up there. Yeah, go ahead. Tell us who you are. Thank you. Um, my name is Gregory Dunn. I'm a freshman at college. And when you did that Where are you from? I'm from uh, Harvard College. I'm originally from California. Um, when, when you mentioned the example of Chinese investment in Chinese sports, um, it called to mind an article in the Times about two months ago, which um, stated that some of the reasons why the Chinese investment was so successful was that It's a very good question. The, I think there, there is a, the more sort of traditional philosophy is concerning competitiveness. Uh, and I remember lots of discussions inside Greece, uh, even recently, but also with the different officials <coughs> from the so-called Troika, how to become more competitive. Well, one, one more orthodox way is to say cut wages, uh, cut benefits. Uh, and so it's basically a race to the bottom. Now, I don't see how a race to the bottom will make us more competitive with the Chinese. Uh, uh, I, I would, and I would not only say that, but I would say that uh, this is not only a European problem, this is a problem here in the United States too. Uh, we, you have countries, uh, emerging markets, where they don't have labor rights, uh, they don't have collective bargaining, they can degrade the environment if they want to, uh, much more easily. Uh, they can, uh, sometimes they don't even have democratic rights. Now, that is a model which gives some comparative advantage in this world market, but that's not a model we should emulate. I would see a race to the top, and why not, instead of asking for wages to go be cut in the industrialized nations, is to see how we, uh, we raise wages and standards in the developing and the emerging markets. So I would see that that would be a way of competitive. But secondly, of being, becoming more competitive. But secondly, as that is more of a global strategy, I would say that as far as Europe is concerned, maybe possibly the US, why not investment in areas which will make us more competitive? And I would see, rather than investing in the inequality, let's invest in quality. Quality would mean products which are um, high technology, uh, high investment in education, high investment in, in, in the prospects of green growth. We need to do that I mean, sooner or later. And I, would, uh, I, was, I was hoping, I was Prime Minister when we had the Copenhagen meeting for the climate change issue, and I was, I was just after the crisis in, in 2008, this was 2009, I was hoping we would combine as a world the two issues, financial crisis and the global warmth issue. We, could, we would say, let's invest, let's create, let's create the, the structures and the regulation to, to incentivize and, and leverage the private sector so that they would invest and with us, with them, governments, in a growth stimulus, which would be a green growth that is dealing with the climate change at the same time. And luckily that didn't happen. What's been the reaction in Piraeus to the Chinese investment and how they're paying their workers and that kind of thing? I mean, is it accepted? Are people reasonably happy with it? Uh, I, think that, I think that in general, uh, people were happy that there was investment uh, coming to Greece. And as a matter of fact, when the Chinese did come in, it was a sense of vote of confidence uh, in the Greek economy. And people uh, felt that. And people felt that. Yeah. Uh, I, we had other offers also um, from Qatar. They, they had come in uh, for uh, an investment of something like five billion. Uh, but then as then the euro crisis started to develop and people were talking about a, a Grexit, as they call it, the exit from 
from, from, from the euro. And they said, well, let's wait a little while and see if, if, if you exit or don't. Because, of course, people, if they invest in euros and then we go back to drachma, they would lose a lot of money. That's why I'm saying that, that stability, even, the austerity, even though the austerity measures were, were very tough, uh, what, what undermined uh, the, not only the economy, but a sense of, of, of trust in, inside, inside Greece was this continued uncertainty which didn't allow people to be able to plan for their lives, didn't know what would be coming the next day, whether it would be in the drachma or the euro. That has to stop, and that's where Europe, only Europe by itself, uh, not, not Greece alone, but Europe all together, we, we have to stop that sense of instability. And I think now that is coming to an end. That's my hope. Sir. <clears throat> um, my name is John Gabrielli, and I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, and I'd like to ask a question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Um, this question is addressed to both of you. Do you think you could talk a little bit about some of the difficulties associated with governing during a time of economic crisis, um, and in particular, reevaluating your policy priorities in light of the uh, exigencies of the particular situation? In the light of what? The exigencies you face uh, in that situation. Am I, I'm not getting, am I getting Sorry, the, the difficulties, uh, the, the necessity of dealing with uh, the economic situation. Okay. George, why don't, you what, why don't you go on this one? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think an economic crisis is an opportunity to do things. Not to kind of, I'm with George, I mean, not to sit in your hands and do nothing. Um, if, you, if you're in politics, folks, you're in it because you want to get things done. You know, people these days come up to me and say, well, life must be better now if you're, you're out of politics because you're never out of politics. Um, not so much pressure. And I say, you don't understand us, guys. You know, we love pressure. I mean, that's why we do it. <laughs> We don't want to be sitting on the sidelines. We want to be actively involved in trying to solve these problems. So if you do run into something like this, as our president did, um, you're elected to act, and you want to act. And uh, you know, I've got my own views on how you deal with something like this. Austerity never, ever got any country out of recession. Now, that does not mean that we don't need uh, an eight or 10 year time frame here, and I think the same is true with Greece, where you have a thrill. But remember, this country was in great shape when Clinton left office, and there are reasons why we are not in great shape these days. Um, and you don't want to make those mistakes again. So uh, investing heavily in infrastructure and putting people to work doing that is an essential part of this country's future. Our, infra our infrastructure is falling apart. You know, it's a little embarrassing to come back from Europe and the Far East and uh, putz along at 80 miles an hour uh, on an Amtrak train, isn't it? I mean happens to be an obsession of mine, but, um, you know, this is absurd. I mean, I'm driving around this state looking at rusting bridges and uh, a transit system which is one of the best in the country, but it's nowhere near as good as it should be, and I see a recession as a great time to do something about that. I mean, money doesn't cost anything to borrow. Contractors are hungry. They're bidding low. I mean, this is the time to invest this kind of thing and to do some of the other things that George talked about. I mean, they're not very different in terms of investing in education, investing in research and development, all this kind of stuff, getting serious about climate change. I mean, this is a great opportunity to do this. Now, how do you communicate that to the folks that elected you and you hope will re-elect you? I mean, how do you frame it in a way that uh, makes sense? We've got to, you know, this, this is a country that, that uh, until recently has never been willing to make a commitment to to a very simple proposition, that all Americans should have decent and affordable health care. And a lot of people criticized Obama for making health care a priority at a time when he really should have focused on the economy. Well, he didn't. And I think we're a lot closer to the time when all working Americans and their families are going to have decent, affordable health care than we ever have been. And I think uh, the president saw that as an opportunity to, to drive that issue. And he's I think effectively won it. So, um, windy answer to your question, but um, I think times of economic stress are times when political leaders can step up and really try to make things happen. And I think you agree. No, I agree, and I think that, uh, as you said, that when in, in a time of crisis you can, you can have a politics of fear, and that's what some of the conservatives, I would say, in, in Europe certainly have, are trying to develop. Uh, but you can also have a politics of, 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 of hope and, 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 of, and of possibility. And 
If you look at Europe, and, and Europe is, an, is, is interesting because Europe is an experiment of very different countries in different, in different areas. If you look to the Nordic countries, uh, they have high taxes, but they, are, they have social cohesion. They have great infrastructure for all kinds of public uh, services, whether it's transportation. I know that's one of your babies uh, here in, uh, in, the, in this region, but also in, you know, from kindergarten to, uh, to schools to healthcare. And they are the, one of the most competitive economies in the world. I and mean, they're doing pretty well these days, they're aren't doing, they? They're doing very well. And they, they, so, so it, is, it is not, competitiveness does not mean that you have to be sort of a race to the bottom. This is, this is a high, these are high quality economies. So I, I obviously myself saw the, 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 this crisis as an opportunity, although what happened is that it was such a, a, um, a confluence of, 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 of problems where you had not only Greece, but you had the European problem, you had the wider world recession, you had the markets, you had the, 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 the lights on, on us for every little problem that would, would, ha would occur. So politically it was much more difficult. But somebody asked me once, he said, aren't you, aren't you, don't you feel that you're very unhappy that, you know, you, you, you were saddled with the problem as, as prime minister? I mean, it happened to be on your term that, that you went through this crisis and, and, and you had to deal with this huge deficit and debt and, and, and the whole crisis. And I, had, and, and I thought about it and I, and I responded and I said, well, in fact, it's an honor that, that I was asked to serve my country at such a dire moment. And I think that's how, how politicians should think. Sir. Good evening. My name is Alexander Vassalimo. I'm chairman of a think tank, the Center for Security and Social Progress. Uh, the population of Greece is about 11 million. In addition, there are millions of people of Greek descent living in many countries all over yes. the world, including 3 million um, Greek Americans. This diaspora has maintained its Greek culture, its orthodox faith, and often its language. So my question is, what can this Hellenic diaspora do to help Greece with its current difficulties? Well, that's a good question, I think, Mike, and uh, of course, uh, I'm sure you have something to say about that, too. I, I, I think diaspora, the diaspora cultures, and we're not, if you talk about Greeks, certainly, but I think diaspora cultures around the world are a very important uh, part of, of uh, particularly now in this globalizing world, because of the experience that they have uh, bring in, the knowledge they bring in from different parts of the world. So we have Greeks that are in Latin America, America, Canada, Australia, South Africa, Europe, former Soviet Union, and so on. And they, they can bring in uh, uh, all kinds of experiences. And I would say that one thing they bring in more than anything else, well, I would say not just that, but certainly from their experience, they also bring in hope. They know that sometimes what's, what's going on in their country, which, which they have had to leave, and their country, when it gets into problems, they know that it doesn't have to do with their country alone, with just their country or with some cultural issue, because they know that they have been able to, um, to, to, to reach their aspirations or show that they're you know, hardworking or, or, or thrive in different cultures as long as they were necessary institutions, the necessary reforms, the necessary environment. So I think that they come in with a view that, you know, we can change, you know, a sense of hope you know, if we create the necessary governance structures, the necessary institutions, the necessary education, we can change. Now, Greece, of course, has changed over the years, and, 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 it, and lots of the diaspora, actually after the dictatorship, went back to, to from, particularly from Europe, went back to Greece, and many of them became, some of them prime ministers, both my father and Simitis were diaspora, parts of the diaspora, but also many ministers, uh, uh, but many other people even went back to their villages. Uh, so I think they have a lot to, a lot to contribute. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I do hope um, in my new capacity of uh, roaming around a bit universities and speaking to be able to link up uh, the, the Greek diaspora in, in, in thinking about the future of Greece in a more constructive and, and systematic way. So thank you. But for reforms that. in Greece are very important. Um, I remember once we stayed in a hotel on Santorini, which was the result of a, an investment by somebody from the Boston Greek community. This was many years ago. And they had to pay off everybody in sight to get the damn thing yeah, built. Yeah. 
you're just not going to get Greek Americans, no matter how proud we are, we are of our background and history and tradition and religion and so on. We're just not going to go, even in a country we love, we're not going to go in and play that game, which is one of the reasons why these reforms are just so important, even for those of us who have a strong inclination to try to be helpful. Uh, Bill Clinton was over there and talked about uh, That's right. a Greek version of bonds for Israel. And, uh, and I think there'd be a lot of support for that. But Greek Americans, even Greek Americans here in the United States, aren't going to do that unless they think that those funds are going to be used effectively and honestly, and everybody's cousin is going to be taking a piece of it. And, uh, and I think that's very important. I agree, you absolutely. That and that's, and that's why I said, you know, fight clientelism, fight graft, bring in transparency, uh, create the institutions which will actually create trust, first of all, amongst the people, Greek people themselves, but, you know, for the taxpayer in, in Greece, but also for people who want to come and invest. And I think we're, we're moving in that direction. I mean, uh, I was, I've, I've told my John previously, was being, he's one of our the liaisons, there's a great group of liaisons here with, you know, I don't know if you know the IOP tradition here, and thank the, I want to thank them publicly for all their sort of support this, this, this semester. A great, great bunch of, of students and friends. Um, and uh, we've talked about this a number of times. One, one of the examples, I forced through computeriza computerization of uh, prescriptions. In, I started with one pension fund, and uh, doctors were resisting it. Uh, because they were getting kickbacks from the big pharmaceutical companies to, for huge and, and very expensive treatments. In, in, in one month, we cut the cost by 30% just by that computerization, which cost us almost nothing. So this is where the reforms are needed. And look, it's not a problem we're unfamiliar with. When I was first elected to the Massachusetts legislature in 1962, this state was one of the three or four most corrupt states in the country. When I was out knocking on doors in the town of Brookline campaigning, people would say, you look honest, I'll vote for you. I finally called my mother. I said, mi tera, you know, I mean, thanks for producing a kid that looks honest. I'm serious, it was that bad. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that from time to time we don't have integrity problems in this state, but it's a hell of a lot better, better than it was. And we had to do it. We had to do it as, as, I mean, if we wanted people to get serious about investing in the state, making commitments in the state, you couldn't give them that kind of stuff. And Greece has the same problem, it's got to deal with it. If it does, then I think... We will. The diaspora will, will, will respond, and respond enthusiastically and, and effectively. Yeah. But um, I, I, I can't forget <laughs> the conversations I had with these, these folks who were investing in this hotel, Santorini. And oh, you're right, but I think this is also another problem which we see around the world because of the concentration very often of wealth and, and power, right. yeah. how politics become, become captured. Uh, and of course, each country has gone through different, different stages. I mean, you, I mean, the U.S. has its, you know, the prohibitions and the mafias and the, but even the Enrons. I mean, these are, these are parts of, of the system where we need to democratize and make our political systems more transparent, more accountable. And that's, that's creating trust uh, in our citizens. And of course, then, that is part of the development story, because when you do create trust, uh, when you have democratic institutions, uh, this is an area And where you create sta stability, very stability. important. Then you'll get innovation, then you'll get investment, and you'll get people really building for the future. Thanks. Who's next? My name is Michael, I'm from Germany. I'm here at Kennedy School in the MPA program. So in the last couple of months, there has been a lot of discussion about the German role in the Euro crisis. Some ask for, you know, call for more German leadership. Others call for different German leadership. So I'd be interested what your perspective is on the German role in the Euro crisis. Well, I obviously had a lot of talks with the German leaders. Um, and very often during the European Council, the European Councils, for those who don't know it, are the meeting of the heads of states and, and governments of the 27 countries. Uh, and uh, we, would all, we would have uh, our, our official positions, but then we would have our, our meals where we'd sit together. And I almost invariably was sitting next to Angela Merkel, so we had a lot of time to, to talk about this crisis. I, I think that, that, that the, the, 
the narrative that was created by some of the politicians in Germany was, as I, mean, as I, I can understand the narrative, was saying, listen, this money of yours, I'm going to be very careful with it because we have these profligate, you know, um, southerners here and, you know, we can't risk our money on them. Uh, and, um, and I have always said that these bailout programs are not to give money to the countries to continue their practice of the past, but in fact, it is an investment for the future. It's an investment for a better Europe. It's, investor, a better, it's an investment for a better Greece, uh, a better Spain. And maybe we didn't have our chance after the dictatorships. I mean, think of Spain, Portugal, and Greece, three countries that went through dictatorships. So we didn't go through our glasnost and perestroikas. We went straight into the European Union, and a lot of these problems were, 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 uh, were um, papered over. But Germany went through a very long period recently with its unification of change, difficult change. But it took 10, 20 years. Uh, I talked to Schroeder and, and he said, uh, you know, he, 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 could, he, he had to do the reform program as the so-called 2010 reform program. And he said, I could not have done both austerity and reform at the same time. You've been asked to do both at the same time. So I think this is where there should have been a more of an understanding of the deeper problems uh, of, of the type of things we are facing rather than simplistically sort of trying to get into this, into this narrative. Now, I think that's changing in Europe. I think that's changing in Germany. Uh, but I can understand that the, the Germans are saying, well, can we trust? Uh, can we trust this European Union? And I think that has, been, that has been one of the problems of the past years, that there's been a sense of mis we are mistrusting ourselves. Let's put it that way in Europe. We are mistrusting the European project. Can it really work? And I think what we need to change as a narrative is say, in fact, this is a, not a leap of faith, but if we do believe in it, it will work. We need to change things, we need to look at monitoring, we need to look at a number of institutions, but we have already pooled our risks. Now we need to pool our resources and our strengths. And I, I, I always felt that, that um, sometimes in Germany, people underestimated the capabilities of Europe. Uh, I think we have many more capabilities uh, if we work together. And, uh, and I think this is a message we need to get across to the, to the German people. We need to, get to, work, we need to work together. Uh, uh, we need to get beyond the nationalisms. I'm very, very unhappy to see the, the, the rise of nationalism uh, in, in my country and all the, uh, the racism that, that exists and, and all the um, bashing of any, of any other citizens. Uh, the, whether they are Europeans or not. But I also I don't like the sort of simplistic Greek bashing also, which is, doesn't have a basis. I mean, if it, was, if it was the fact that we danced Zorba and drank Uzo, then that would be easy to solve the problem. Huh? But I think, I think lots of the Northerners like to come to Greece to dance Zorba and, and drink Uzo. So, uh. There are a lot <laughs> around, I can tell you that. Yeah. But I think I, I, I do hope that the narrative in Germany is starting to change. And uh, of course, I would hope for it. Uh, success of the progressive forces in Germany in the next elections. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Aaron Kanzer. I'm a freshman undergrad at Northeastern. And I have a question for the uh, Prime Minister. Um, what are you majoring in? Uh, political science. Well, I, um, I hope I'll have you before you leave. So, too. Um, two summers ago, I was able to witness uh, some of the rioting in Syntagma Square in Athens. And as an observer, um, I was curious to see, to, I was wondering how much did that really affect uh, yourself and the rest of the parliament to act? Well, first of all, obviously this is, uh, this, when you take these difficult decisions and when people feel pain, uh, I mean, you, you, feel, you feel the pain also and it's, 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 it's there. And I was there and I, would, and I was right next to the, to the demonstrations. Uh, I was, I was basically saying, you know, um, as long as we make sure that these, these demonstrations are peaceful, uh, we don't have violence, uh, we don't have victims. Uh, and luckily, one demonstration, there were two firebombs that were thrown and uh, people were killed. Uh, that was some, some about a year and a half ago. But um, generally, they've been, been actually, be, despite the pictures and, and, and the media, they've been generally peaceful and people have generally wanted them to be peaceful. Now, uh, of Amongst the demonstrators, you have different groups, of course. I think there are those who genuinely have felt the pain because we've cut their wages and, and they've been, you know, basically 
lower lower middle class uh, or, or even poorer peoples and, and we've tried we we tried to avoid uh, hurting the the weakest uh, as much as we could but there are others that had privileges and and very big privileges and you know and huge pensions or or, or um, many more wages and and uh, and uh, uh, or just thought that they could c continue with this sort of clientelistic politics, and uh, for them, I don't, I don't have uh, many qualms. And, uh, I mean, they they were demonstrating too, so it's, it's a bit of a diverse, diverse group. But the pain is there, and I think the pain is 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 is, is more than one should have sustained. Uh, that's why I said that I believe that uh, had we been given more time, and had this been more of, more of a humane. Um, type of a process and more of a secure process because we were we got into this bailout fund to, pr to protect Greece from the market uh, sort of uh, fears but in fact market fears didn't didn't leave I mean they kept on talking about Greece leaving the euro uh, banks were being run on and so on so th this this wasn't this didn't didn't happen and I think this is where Europe really should have step, stepped in more more forcefully uh, and I think it would have been better for not only Greeks but even for the Germans who are you know lending to us because it's cost Europe much more uh, today than it would have cost had we been much more forceful uh, initially. Let me just give you one example, uh, talk, uh, you know, referring to also the, the, the German experience. In 2008, uh, when, the two th when the crisis, uh, the, the financial crisis took place around the world, the spreads, does anybody, does anybody know what the spreads are, the interest rates on, on, on the bonds of the peripheral countries or the southern countries, some of the smaller countries, uh, sovereign bonds, the state bonds, the interest rates went up. So the market was starting to be fearful of the countries, uh, these countries, and they were saying, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't invest in these countries because maybe this crisis will hit them. The then finance minister, Steinbrück, he now is the candidate for, for chancellor for the next elections for the Social Democrats, but he then was in a coalition with the, uh, the Conservative Party, the Christian Democratic Party. He was the finance minister. He came out with one statement and he said, listen guys, to the markets, don't worry, we're here. There will be no problem with the debt of these countries. We guarantee it and that's it. The next day the spreads went out and everybody forgot about it. Friend went down. The interest rates went down and everybody forgot about it. The crisis was over. That did not happen when I, on my watch. Uh, there was much more of a, uh, a fear to come out forcefully and say, you know, we're here, markets don't worry, and we let the markets, you know, play havoc, really. I'm getting the cut sign. So I think we're going to have to bring things to a close, though, a little, a little bit anyway. And if folks want to come up and chat with us, we'd be happy to do that. Great to see you. Great to have you with us. And uh, let me just conclude, folks, by saying that you're looking at a couple of people that have been in political life virtually all our lives, haven't lost our enthusiasm for it, um, feel pretty good about what we've done, even though we've taken some heat from time to time. And, lost a few elections, and I hope this is an inspiration to those of you particularly who are here at the college or uh, in school. Uh, I want to see every single one of you get seriously, deeply involved in the politics of your community, state, and country. Uh, George and I have had uh, remarkable lives. I don't think we'd swap them for anything. And as you can see, we're still at it. So um, I hope you'll do the same. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And I just want to thank you. Let me just thank Mike and, and, and just reiterate what he said. That, that uh, you know, it's uh, the the challenges in the world are, are great, uh, and uh, whatever the difficulties, uh, being part of trying to make changes and participating is 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 what politics is. Is what it was in ancient in ancient Greek democracy. Uh, being part of this uh, this political life, uh, and I would I think the people here that I've met uh, are, are are people that will be uh, amazing future leaders, and I'm glad to be part of this this very large family of of Harvard. It's good and to great have to be you. with you, Mike. It's good to have you, Joe. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Again. It's great to be with you.